morning. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, Ben. Hey, uh, uh, so welcome to the pre, 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 pre Super Bowl party. Glad you're here. How many uh, are going for the Kansas City Chiefs? Just, yeah. How many of the Eagles? Seven of you. Good. Well, <laughs> I asked a question this week in our, our Harvest production meeting. I, 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 asked, um, I asked our team, I said, okay, I'm really curious. I want to know the answer to this. What is your favorite Super Bowl halftime show that you've ever seen? And if it's not Prince, how does it feel to be wrong? That's what I asked. <laughs> Apparently it was leading. It was a leading question. Um, you know, I, I just, I remember, you have whatever opinion you want on that, but I just remember we were at some friend's house and I was, I was watching that particular halftime show and uh, it was an open air stadium. I couldn't even tell you where it was, but I just remember Prince is like doing Purple Rain and it's like raining and it was purple. And I just remember going, wow, that's kind of amazing. I'm watching it, right? But I, I feel like if, if you were there, and you were sitting in that space, you did more than just watch that halftime show. I would wager to say that you would walk away and say, I didn't just watch it, I experienced it, right? I think there's a, a difference between watching something and actually experiencing something. Like uh, uh, just recently, I've, I've, I love all different kinds of music. My Spotify playlist would probably confuse you. Uh, I love classical. I love orchestra. I love uh, Handel's Messiah. Just last December in our sanctuary, we had the Messiah sing-along, and it was, it was beautiful. And I sat there, and you know, I've listened to it on CD, digital. I've listened to it so many times, but on that particular Sunday afternoon to sit in that room and to look at a conductor who was standing in front of a 60-voice orchestra and 40-plus, a 60-voice choir and 40-plus orchestra members. It was like to watch that conductor lead. It, it was more than just watching something. It was experiencing something. And I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where maybe you've been at a symphony and you've seen a, a conductor. I, I, I found this picture. I don't know. I'd love to give her credit. I feel like if you try to take a picture of me during a sermon, that's what it's going to, because I'm a bit of a nightmare to take a still picture, but... I don't know her, but I'm telling you, like that, I guarantee you the people that were there had an experience. And why? Because they had someone who was leading the music, who was looking at the choir, who was looking at the orchestra, and was directing them into something that was greater. And I think that's not, when we're talking about being gifted and talented in spiritual gifts, church, I, I think this is a really good setup for what the Holy Spirit does and what the Holy Spirit is doing over the church today. <laughs> I think it's just the Holy Spirit. I think the church, when she is at her best, it is the Holy Spirit that is looking at all of us in this room today. Whether you realize it or not, you have a unique set of skills and giftings that's come, that's gifted to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what I want to do, where Susan last week talked about identity, and rightfully so. I mean, before you really go anywhere, you just have to stop Ephesians 2 and remember you're, um, you're God's masterpiece, created, right? Gifted with certain abilities um, for such a time as this. So to understand that you're sons and your daughters of the Most High God, to sit in that, that was her application for you. Just sit in that. What does it mean to know that you're sons and daughters of the King? But today what I want to do is I want to go a little deeper and I want to talk about, all right, when it comes to spiritual gifts, then what's the purpose? What's the purpose? And that takes me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you, if you will, open it up to 1 Corinthians 12. I just want to take the first 11 verses because Paul, the Apostle Paul who writes this, is addressing some issues that the church of Corinth is having. He's addressing some conflict. Paul, what I know and what I kind of love about Paul is he was not afraid to address conflict in the church. Just, I'm curious, how many of you are absolutely terrified? You just hate conflict. How many of you, a few of you, I'm gonna boldly raise my hand. Like I've just, I've never loved conflict. And thank you, Lord, he made me senior pastor of this church. So I gotta say, I'm getting a little better at it. But the truth is, whether you like conflict or not, it's pretty good to address things that might be destructive, especially when it comes to the body of Christ. For example, 
If you get a cancer diagnosis, it's one thing to just ignore it and say, you know what, I'm not even going to think about it. But it's another thing to know, you know what, if I don't aggressively do something about this, it could ultimately destroy the body. So Paul, who would go in and start these churches and then leave and start new churches, would get wind of some things that were growing inside the body that if, if not addressed, could ultimately kill the body, could kill the church. So believe it or not, spiritual gifts was one of the things that the church of Corinth was actually arguing over. And here's what it was. There were some who had the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues at this church. And they actually said, those who had it, the, the idea was that their gift of speaking in tongues was the best gift. And if you didn't have the gift of speaking in tongues, well, that was a secondary gift. But they just said that theirs was the greatest gift. Aren't church people fun? So they were actually arguing that their gift of speaking in tongues was better. So Paul addresses this. And here's where we start in 1 Corinthians 12.1. Paul says, now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed, for you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So, what does that mean? Paul is basically saying to the church, all right, there was a time that you didn't profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There was a time that you were just at the whim of the current of culture. Your mute idols, he said. You had pagan gods, stone, wood, but they never really spoke to you or led you. So you were at the fancy of culture. But Paul says that's not who you are anymore. You see, if you say Jesus is Lord, especially for century, I mean, Caesar is Lord. Caesar was Lord. Caesar was the one who was above everything. But to say Jesus and Lord, that's, that'll get you in serious trouble because he's the primary one over your life. So you know that when you give your life to Jesus, you have the power of the Holy Spirit who is in you. <laughs> so that's where the Spirit moves, is you have the Spirit in you. I mean, Jesus told his friends, I, I was thinking about this this week in John's Gospel. He said, listen, I... I can't stay with you. He said this to his disciples. Like, I, I, have to, I have to go, and I have to go be with the Father. But when I do, I'm not leaving you as orphans, but instead I'm going to send in the Spirit. And through the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, the authority that's given to you through the Spirit, he says, you're going to see even greater things than you've seen with me in my lifetime. Do we take the Holy Spirit up on that every single day? I mean, I wonder, do we, do we wake up like... I just, I'm so convicted because I think, you know, we always plan all these sermon series out. I love that we do, but I just, I'm feeling a little shaken that we need to get back into the teaching on the third person of the Trinity. We need to talk more about the power of the Holy Spirit. Anybody else feeling that? I feel like we need to get back. What is the role? See, the Holy Spirit, do not confuse the Holy Spirit with Casper the Friendly Ghost. Very different. Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. So Jesus said, I have to go to the Father. So right now he's interceding on behalf of the Father and he's speaking to us through the power of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit that abides in us. Now, imagine if Jesus had never left. What if the disciples were like, please, please, please stay, don't go. And he's like, okay. So here we are 2,000 years later. You got something going on in your life, right? New job, new career. You really need some words from the Lord on that relationship. You don't know, is this guy the right guy? Is he not? So what do you do? Well, I'm guessing you'd have to get on a plane, fly to Bush, get over to Tel Aviv, get into Jerusalem, if that's where Jesus is. I mean, here we are, 2023, so maybe it's like the DMV. You walk up there, you pull a number. Oh, great, there's 3.2 million people in front of me. So you, you just wait in line. And you eat falafel and some hummus. And 40 years later, you get up to Jesus and you're like, I really have a question. Because you're like 90. <laughs> and you're like, I don't know. And Jesus is like, I'm so sorry. My goodness, I know. It's been like 40 years. Listen, this is super awkward. You only have three and a half, half days left on this earth. So I'm saying, right. Like, there's no way that would work. So, of course, Jesus says, the way this thing is going to move, the way the world, Asbury Revival, 
He's going to be changed. He's going to be stirred as he looks at the 12 and he says, now go into all the nations. Take the authority. Take the power of the Holy Spirit with you. So in the church, the the challenge is sometimes we get so lost and and I think the enemy loves to just distract us with little bitty things. So here's this church saying, my gift is better than your gift. So Paul says, stop. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Pay attention to that. And then he goes deeper and he talks about the source of the gifts that we have. Look at what he says. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. What's really interesting there, he says, different gifts, same spirit. Different service, same Lord. Different workings, same God. He's saying through everyone's unique giftings that exist inside the church, it all comes from the same source, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, you know that Anytime I, I, I preach, I'm just, I'm, I'm in the text all week. So sometimes I get so deep into it that I'm just looking at everything through the filter of what I'm preaching on Sunday. And if you want to know how to pray for my wife, that's a real specific way right now to pray for her. Because sometimes I just get a little lost in my head. Example, I'm eating dinner in my kitchen this week. And she made an amazing meal and I just lean back and I go, oh, it's so good. And she said, thank you. And I said, no, not the food. Wrong thing to say. Because I was having a dialogue in my head. She said, I'm sorry. I said, no, 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 this is wonderful. And then I looked at her. This is me. If you wonder what ADHD looks like. I looked at her and I said, no, I'm so sorry. I was just talking about the mixer, the blender, the microwave, the coffee maker, and the coffee grinder. And she goes, that still doesn't help me. You're driving. What are you talking about? I said, oh, that's it. Yes. Because you see, in the kitchen, I'm surrounded by all of these appliances. We all have them, right? And what do they do? They all serve very specific needs. The mixer mixes things. The microwave, it is only good for popcorn. You're welcome. You get into the the coffee grinder, the coffee machine. You go into the utility room. You've got a dryer. You've got a washer. See, all of these things, very specific But here's the thing that Paul is saying. There is one power source. They all have a plug. And they all plug into the wall. They all have the same power source. So Paul says, remember, you have the spirit in you. Remember where these giftings come from. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's your power source. And then he gives us the purpose. So what is the purpose of spiritual gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Now, to each one... The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Let's let's read it together. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To each one. Stephen, just leave leave that verse up there for just a moment. To each one, every single one of us here, if you've given your life to Jesus, you have a gift. You have a spiritual gift. And there is a central purpose. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit. Manifestation is a big word. We don't use it often. But it just basically means to bring to light. Manifest. To reveal. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So that the church is at her best when we are living into individually the unique giftings that have been given to you to reveal or to make known the glory of God for the common good. It changes things. When the world, listen, when the world hears the music that the church is making, go back to the conductor, when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead the church and when we step out of the pews, And we actually serve, not just within the church, but outside the church and live into our giftings for the manifestation to glorify what God is doing in our life, then it actually changes things. Now, to show you what that looks like, there he is. Y'all, this is Vincent. Can you just give Vincent a hand? He knew this was coming. 
I sent him a text. I said, Vincent, I need your special skills of playing the piano. I don't play the piano. Um, so what Paul is saying is, Paul, Paul's putting it this way. So, uh, Vincent, there's a middle C. Okay. That's middle C. You're welcome. If you didn't know anything else, there's that. Now, play middle C again. Okay. Now, vigorously play middle C. Just keep going. Why do I hear the Lone Ranger? Anyone? Okay, stop. One note. That's just one note. So the problem that Paul had with the Corinthian church is all of those who said, no, mine's the best, they were a one-note church. And Paul's going, no, 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 stop. Because if the church, if everybody just said, hey, this gift is the best, this is the gift that, the one that we should have, the church doesn't get the melody. They don't get the full beauty of everybody living into their gifting. So what I know about music is this. Aside from C, you also have the key. You've got like E and G. Play, play the range of C. Keep going. You hear it? When you add in all of these other keys, not one key is better than the other, but when you add in all of these other keys, what you actually do is you bring out the flavor. You bring out the experience of the music that is being created, church. This is what a lost world needs to hear. It's what a lost world needs to hear. We get so one note sometimes. And we forget that every single one of us, we all play a role in this music, in this orchestra that the Holy Spirit is conducting. So Paul says to one, verse 8, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith. Another, gifts of healing. Another, miraculous powers and prophecy. Another, distinguishing between spirits. Another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still, to another, the interpretation of tongues. I just realized when I was reading this, to a church that just thought that speaking in tongues was the greatest of gifts, Paul actually put that last in the list. Verse 11. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. You hear it? Now, we're going to go deeper in spiritual gifts. I'll, I'll talk about planning. I'm going to go deeper in Romans 12 next week. But what I want you to do is just settle into what are the giftings? What are the things that you just feel like the Lord has gifted you with? The very unique, specific giftings that you have. Because what I find is, is this, God's work, I love this quote, done God's way for God's glory will never lack God's supply. God's work done God's way for God's glory will never lack God's supply. So application, here's your homework this week, two things. One. Just remember, delighting in your gifts, it delights the giver. I think that when you just learn to settle into your giftings, it just delights the Father. Because remember, when the Spirit comes, I mean, the Spirit, on the other side of receiving the Spirit, I actually think new gifts are given to us. Um, go back to Moses in the Old Testament. I mean, if Moses, there's personalities, there's things that you're good at, but if Moses took a personality test, before the burning bush, guess what? Prophet, speaker, teacher would not have been high on his list. Why? Because he had a stutter. He couldn't speak. He goes to God and God says, go. This is what I want you to say. And Moses is like, I have a stutter. God says, all right, take your brother Aaron. Question, anybody ever hear Aaron speak for Moses? No. You know why? Because when the Spirit sends, the Spirit equips and the Spirit gives. Moses became a prophet. He became a teacher. What are the things, here's a great way to find out what your gifts are. What are the things that give you life? 
What are the things that just feed you? I mean, I'm looking at Tammy. I'm looking at all of these people. Last week, we had a leadership training event in our church. We had over 300 leaders. Listen, you better believe, I am so thankful. My word, Lord, I am so thankful that there are people in our church who are gifted with spreadsheets and a knowledge of finance. Because let me tell you, if I was just running all of that, (laughs) that wouldn't be good. But there are people that are here. You have unique giftings. What are your giftings? What are the things that the Spirit has given to you? It's so easy. And I wonder, has the church done this here in the West? Have we almost, this is a terrible thing if it's the case, convinced the congregations that the only ones who are equipped to do the work of ministry are the ones who have the Master of Divinity degree? The only ones who literally can go and pray for others are those who stand on this stage and lead the congregational prayers. No, I don't need all of us to leave our jobs and to quit our secular work and go to work for the church. What I need is I need you to live out of your giftings that the Lord has given you and take thou thy authority and go and spread that, the manifestation of the spirit for the glory of God, for the common good. You may just say, you know what, all I can do is make a really good bowl of guacamole. Well, I want to tell you, can I just say it? I'm going to add it to the list. That is a spiritual gift, my friends. If you have the ability to make a really good bowl of guacamole with some corn chips, and you take that to a next-door neighbor who's hurting or struggling, and you just sit down and you love on them, and you show them Jesus through that gift of guacamole, then glory to God. He'll use it. Delighting in your gifts, it delights the giver. But also this, you need to know this, using your gifts, it benefits the body of Christ. When we all lean in, I'm telling you, the church, the music that's made, it can transform and change the world. You just have to step from knowing what your gifts are to actually serving and to living them out. As the band comes out, there is one last story. (laughs) 9.30 9.30 didn't like this very much, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> it, was a, uh, it was a college coach. He's a football coach. And there was a reporter that asked him the question. They said, how much does football contribute to the national physical fitness picture? Okay. How much does football contribute to the national physical fitness picture? And the coach looked at the reporter and said, nothing. And the reporter said, nothing. And the coach said, well, the way I see it, there's 22 men on the field who desperately need a rest. And there are 40,000 people in the stands who desperately need some exercise in their life. (laughs) You're welcome. I mean, it's a good question. Is a lost and hurting world, do they just see the church huddle on Sunday mornings but sit in the stands during the week? Take thou thy authority, come on. Pray this prayer this week. Lord, what are the giftings that you've given me? Make a list, just make a list, spend some time in it. And next week, let's go deeper. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I I thank you. Ah, Lord, the spirit's just so thick this morning. I'm so thankful, Father, for for these words, which are your words, for the power of scripture, for this reminder that no matter what we go through, we're not going through it alone. You've gifted us with the power of the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity is right here. And I just get this picture of the Holy Spirit holding a hand out saying, tag me, put me in, put me to work. So Lord, may we be bold in the way that we live for you. May we be bold in the way that we fall on our face before you. May we be bold in the way that we serve the church at the end of our lives. I just pray that Jesus recognizes his pride. We live into who you called us to be, hands and the feet of Christ. So Father, thank you for these hands and feet in front of me. 
Thank you for the hands and feet that are watching this right now, listening to this as a podcast. But Lord, I pray we would just give you our hands and feet. May we walk towards you, be led by you, and may the world hear the symphony of the good news of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. It's in the name of Jesus we say, amen.